instead of referring to evolution as the transmission of genes, then, in one definition I used, evolution becomes the derivational history of these developmental complexes. There's another definition that I've used. Actually, do I have another? This is another one I've used. Evolution is the change in the constitution and the distribution of these developmental systems. This is, by the way, what has to be taken for granted in the more formalized population genetic definitions of evolution. So let me replace this little outline. My objection to the abstract gene flow is not really an objection to a whole discipline. I have no arguments with, with most of that. But when it comes to define our notion of life, what it does is it instrumentalizes the organisms or trivializes them in the way that Stephen was just speaking about. And in the same process, he faces everything that makes possible the repeated life cycle that allow us to make those formalizations in the first place. So in a way, I'm just insisting that we always keep present this living, solid, material background. Once nature is pulled through this dimension of developmental time, as I said, you can no longer contrast nature and nurture. In these processes, I think you just have to look at Stephen Rose's very nice book, Lifelines, to get a sense of how these, these, these events uh, occur over time. These systems don't have clear boundaries, not only because they're changing all the time, and not only because you can study them at varying levels, but also because it extends indefinitely out from the organism itself to encompass climate, other organisms, habitat, as I said, all developmentally relevant aspects of the world. Note, some aspects of that world are sought by the organism, some of them are changed and actually literally constructed by the organism or by its conspecifics. In addition, as was pointed out in The Embodied Mind by Varela, Thompson, and Ross, and also by uh, Hendrix Jansen, the world isn't pre-given. It doesn't simply appear on our doorstep already labeled or you know, shrink-wrapped. It doesn't come pre-registered. The organism's world is co-constructed with it, and the scientist can only draw a pragmatically tentative boundary around it to limit the scope of an inquiry, give a provisional definition, hence development without wall. That's the idea that was behind that part of the title. What I've just said applies to roofs as well as walls. In addition, however, there is this idea of constraints or limits, indeed, of ceiling. These ideas tend to be associated very closely with the idea of uh, the genetic control of developmental outcomes. You think about it, scientists always admit that the conditions of development can, are necessary, they can affect the outcome of the organism's development, but they often insist that it's really the genes that, that uh, determine the limits of such effect. They might say a good environment, for example, may allow a child to reach its full potential, but that the maximum is written in the genes. And perhaps the child has a maximum IQ of 120. It can fall below that, but it can't go above that. But think, if you place this in the context of the systems that I'm talking about, if the effect of any constituent in this system is dependent on the others, what sense does it make to say that the potential or the limits of the system reside in one 
element of that system. Far less that those limits somehow are fixed at conception. And we interact, and according to me, limit possible outcomes given the rest of the system at the time. That is, one could make that argument in an experimental step. Hold everything constant, carry something else. Maybe the system changes, maybe it doesn't. Now, feelings and laws do imply construction, which is central to this developmental systems view that I'm talking about. But it's a particular kind of construction. There's no constructor. There are no pre-existing plans. Not even the well-beloved genetic blueprint. Regularity, when and if it's found, then is accounted for not by central control, but by the functioning of this system. We have linked interactions which must be investigated in order to see what the limits are under certain circumstances, what the possibilities are. These developmental factors, then, are located both inside and outside the body, but we can't actually partition the body or the behavior according to amounts of uh, genetic or environmental causation. It certainly is true that we can trace some behavior through evolutionary relatives, or some behavior might be universal in a species, or some behavior might be hard to perturb under certain circumstances, or it might appear without training. You recognize perhaps all the ear markers of nature, but that certainly doesn't mean that it's more biological than some other aspect of the organism. I must say, I find especially odd the occasional claim that some phenomenon is biological and therefore physical, and therefore real. And I always want to ask, but sometimes I'm too polite to ask, real as opposed to what? Physical as opposed to what? According to me, we're real embodied beings, and this is as real as it gets. Now, having sketched this system's approach to development, and having made clear, I hope, that system here refers to a very extended causal complex, let me distinguish explicitly between drawing a line around an entity, an organism, for example, and drawing a line around the causal complex that produces and maintains and changes that entity. Thinking back on the discussions that I had with Francisco over the years, I've sometimes wondered whether that difference was one of the reasons that we, although our, our sympathies were quite evident, we sometimes felt, or I felt at least, some difficulty in getting beyond that to a really meaty, substantive discussion of our differences. And I've wondered, especially because seemed often to be saying the same things in different ways, whether the fact that the, the preoccupation with elaborating an internal point of view at that time in the work um, with, with seeing the system from the inside, bounded in internality, was one of the things that kept Francisco and me from getting our hands on the ways in which we may have, have, have disagreed. Although he described, he and Maturana described the relationship between the entity and the surround as very intimate, as mutually constraining, as mutually constructive, in ways that I found very, very congenial. I wondered whether my own history with the nature-nurture problem rendered too problematic this boundary that he used and, and the asymmetrical relations across those boundaries. 